Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, welcome to this session, very timely dedicated to the Paris Charter and what is left of the spirit of Helsinki. Uh, my name is Sylvie Kaufmann. I am a journalist at Le Monde here in Paris, uh, and I am extremely happy <laughs> to moderate this session with an ideal group of speakers to address uh, these issues. Uh, we have with us uh, this morning from Helsinki, the president of the Republic of Finland, Mr. Sauli Ninister, Hova Huamenta, Mr. President. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> Good morning, you. great to see you again. I'm as happy uh, as you are to be present. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, here in Paris, uh, we have Jean-Yves Le Drian, um, the French Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs and uh, European Affairs. Monsieur le Ministre, bonjour. 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 <laughs> uh, I, I'm just checking that everybody can hear everybody. Uh, from Berlin. We are joined by your German colleague, uh, Heiko Maas, Foreign Minister of the Federal Republic. Guten Tag, Herr Minister. Hello, guten Tag. Schön, Sie zu guten sehen. Tag. Zu hören. <laughs> and finally, we have in, in Moscow, Professor Andrei Zagorsky, a well-known Russian expert in international relations and security. Uh, Professor Gimbo, Gimo, sorry, who was, uh, uh, who has first hand experience of the Charter of Paris, because he was there um, as an expert to advise the Soviet delegation. Uh, in, um, he took part in several meetings of the CSC in the late 1980s and in the preparatory committee of the Paris summit in 1990. Gospodin Zagorski, that's with you. Good morning. Hello. It is great to have you too. So uh, a short notice first on the way we are going to proceed. Um, I will very briefly introduce the topic of our discussion, and then uh, I will give the floor to each one of our uh, speakers for about seven minutes. Uh, and then we will turn to your questions, the audience, uh, um, wherever you are, actually. So please do not wait uh, for the end to send uh, your questions. They, you can fill them over to the chat and they will be forwarded to me by the forum's moderators. Uh, and I will ask them to uh, our uh, panelists. So why are we here today? Uh, 45 years ago, the Helsinki Final Act signed by 35 nations sought to turn a page in the Cold War. It was indeed a turning point meant to go beyond the East-West divide and take Europe from détente to rapprochement in a spirit of openness and cooperation. That spirit led to ex the extraordinary events of 1989 and towards 1991, the revolutions in Central Europe and the negotiations for the reunification of Germany. And eventually, very much pushed by President François Mitterrand to the summit of Paris exactly 30 years ago, where the Paris Charter was adopted. It was in a way the culmination of the Helsinki spirit. Uh, it was called the Paris Charter for a New Europe, and it was meant to open, I quote, an era of democracy, of peace, and of unity. So it may be um, a sad irony that on the eve of this anniversary, we have just witnessed in the Caucasus uh, the settlement of a conflict by military force instead of uh, uh, diplomacy or negotiation over the war in Nagorno-Karabakh. So our discussion today is indeed very timely. Uh, Monsieur le Ministre Le Drian, um, I will turn to you first. Uh, 1990 was indeed a formidable year for European diplomacy. There was this immense hope, this formidable ambition uh, expressed in Paris. Was it just a dream? Over to you, Monsieur. Merci de, merci de me donner la parole. Monsieur le Président, merci, euh, Madame Kaufmann. Vous l'avez rappelé, il y a maintenant euh, 30 ans, après 
plusieurs décennies de division tragique, notre continent a pu enfin commencer à marcher vers sa réunification. Et, et à la fin du mois de novembre 1990, les 34 chefs d'État et de gouvernement de la Conférence sur la sécurité et la coopération en Europe se sont réunis à Paris, vous l'avez dit, pour faire de ce nouveau départ l'occasion de bâtir ensemble cette charte de Paris pour une nouvelle Europe, qu'il est opportun et urgent, je pense, de relire aujourd'hui, en commençant par le préambule de cette charte qui, qui, qui cristallise toutes les espérances d'un formidable mouvement d'accélération de l'histoire. Je cite les tout premiers paragraphes. « L'Europe se libère de l'héritage du passé, le courage des hommes et des femmes, la puissance de la volonté des peuples et la force des idées de l'acte final d'Helsinki » ont ouvert une ère nouvelle de démocratie, de paix et d'unité en Europe. Il y avait donc des espérances, mais aussi une exigence, l'exigence de construire une sécurité collective européenne et de mettre en place une architecture fondée sur les principes adoptés à Helsinki 15 ans auparavant, au premier rang desquels se trouvait, je le rappelle, parce que c'est tout à fait d'actualité, la violabilité des frontières, le règlement pacifique des différents, le respect des droits de l'homme et des libertés fondamentales, ces impératifs sont indissociables. La charte l'affirme en liant la construction de notre sécurité collective aux principes démocratiques et aux valeurs humanistes qui nous ont fait et qui font ce que nous sommes. C'est ce que faisait déjà la puissance de la charte hier, mais c'est aujourd'hui sur ces principes que nous devons revenir, car... Il faut être lucide, progressivement, cette immense ambition s'est peu à peu étiolée. Il y a eu une forme de déconstruction progressive de cette architecture qui avait été dessinée à Paris. Il y a... Okay. Okay. J'avais dit ça déjà, j'étais là. Ouais, reprenez, euh, je pense là. Of sound. Yeah, okay. Les solutions militaires euh, sont en train de, euh, de réapparaître et que les clivages et les tensions qui euh, amènent le recours à la force sont maintenant de nouveau en, en, en action. La deuxième évolution préoccupante, euh, incompatible avec l'esprit et le sens de la Charte de Paris, c'est la remise en cause de l'état de droit. L'actualité nous montre ce que cela signifie. Par exemple, en Biélorussie, il s'agit d'atteinte à, à la fois aux droits de l'homme, à la fois aux libertés fondamentales, à la fois à la démocratie, c'est-à-dire aux enjeux qui avaient été affirmés et affichés lors de la signature de la Charte de Paris. Puis enfin, nous faisons face, année après année, à l'érosion progressive du régime de maîtrise des désarmements, les instruments qui avaient été conçus pour renforcer la confiance mutuelle, pour prévenir les tensions, pour maîtriser le risque d'escalade, sont aujourd'hui profondément fragilisés et parfois de façon délibérée. Et nous ne pouvons pas nous résigner, je pense, à la déconstruction de la sécurité collective européenne et, euh, à mon avis, euh, l'opérationnalisation des principes d'Helsinki reste un chantier de notre temps, de notre époque. Et c'est aussi un des, la raison pour laquelle il y a ce débat au sein du Forum de Paris. Ce chantier, je pense que nous devons le mener sur la base de trois piliers. D'abord, une nouvelle relation transatlantique. Et euh, nous avons engagé, et nous allons engager un, un dialogue avec... Euh, la prochaine administration américaine et au cœur de cette nouvelle relation, nous devrons poursuivre le renforcement de l'autonomie d'action des Européens que nous avons engagé parce que nous en avions besoin, mais euh, cela euh, est conforme aussi aux souhaits répétés des présidents des États-Unis euh, pour euh, renforcer euh, notre participation à la sécurité 
du lien transatlantique fondée évidemment sur le cadre de l'OTAN. Nous avons engagé à cet égard une réflexion stratégique. C'est le premier pilier de cette réflexion pour l'avenir. Le deuxième pilier, c'est l'action renforcée des Européens. La dynamique positive qui s'est engagée au fil des dernières années doit se poursuivre au nom de la souveraineté européenne, bien sûr, mais aussi au nom de la charte, car l'expérience montre que l'Union européenne défend dans son action les principes d'Helsinki. Elle les défend dans les réponses qu'elle apporte à les situ aux situations de tension. Elle les défend aussi en mettant en œuvre les sanctions qu'elle adopte sur des situations de crise. Je pense en particulier à la, la violation des règles interdisant le recours aux armes chimiques. C'est essentiel que nous soyons toujours dans cette dynamique de renforcement des réponses inscrites dans les principes d'Helsinki. Puis enfin, le dernier pilier de ce vaste chantier qu'il nous faut relancer, c'est évidemment une organisation de la sécurité en Europe qui garantisse la stabilité stratégique de l'ensemble, notamment avec la Russie. Et pour mettre fin à la déconstruction de la sécurité collective européenne, nous devons trouver avec la Russie les voies d'un dialogue lucide ferme, mais un dialogue sur les conditions de la stabilité stratégique en Europe. C'est un travail de longue haleine auquel nous nous attelons depuis de maintenant, comme vous le savez. Donc le temps, me semble-t-il, est revenu de, de, trouver, de retrouver l'esprit des principes d'Helsinki et de la Charte de Paris. Nous ne pouvons le faire que collectivement, mais parce que la Charte est notre héritage partagé, elle doit rester aussi pour l'avenir notre boussole commune. Merci de votre attention. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Le Drian. President Minister, let me turn to you now. Um, since all this happened in, in Helsinki afterwards, after all, uh, or, or started in Helsinki, uh, how do you see this evolution uh, over the past three decades? Uh, are you disappointed? Uh, do you think things could have gone differently? Thank you. First, if we go back in time to early 70s, uh, there were a lot of doubts dealing with the uh, Helsinki conference before it. Uh, and uh, that's no wonder the Cold War was uh, in the beginning of 70s, maybe at its coldest. So first, it was an achievement in itself to get around the same table, NATO, Warsaw Pact, and uh, some other European countries, an achievement in itself. Uh, namely, if we go to this day, just uh, let us think whether it would be possible to gather modifying uh, modified uh, uh, table i mean uh, worldwide the powers of world is it possible to them to get together like in helsinki i am afraid that the answer is hardly would uh, european countries be ready well we haven't seen not uh, after paris anything similar. Would there be a need for such a conference? I think that uh, we all answer undoubtedly yes. If taking notice to present situation, uh, not only in Europe, but worldwide, like uh, Minister uh, Rian expressed. Then I would uh, like to have a few words on the results of the Helsinki conference, uh, what it actually meant. Later on, immediately, many criticized that uh, actually the conference cemented Cold War division in Europe. But uh, later on, little by little, many have seen Uh, Helsinki conference as an important factor beginning of the end of uh, Cold War. And uh, Paris Charter expressed that very clearly. 
15 years later. It, uh, in the charter, it's referred that uh, the Helsinki Final Act had opened a new era of democracy, peace, and unity in Europe. And um, the Helsinki Conference is still alive. In uh, 1994, it became uh, institutional. The CSCE became OSCE. We have uh, seen that uh, even in OSCE, there are difficulties difficulties to find uh, common solutions to Europe. Then I go to a phrase which is often used that is the health to a phrase which is often used that is the Helsinki spirit, in a way the context of the conference. Did we find uh, such a spirit, an attitude, a positive uh, attitude uh, towards building peace? Yes, first of all, trust was a very important word. Uh, one had to have a lot of trust even to come to the same table, the opponents. You have to have at least some trust to sit down face to face. And uh, that we experienced in Helsinki. The other observation is uh, security and cooperation. We learned that uh, there's not only one without other. Security and co cooperation go hand in hand. And uh, thirdly, the principles which were agreed in Helsinki, like we heard uh, already, uh, those principles are still very up to date. We are trying to follow them, we are emphasizing them, and uh, they will be the <clears throat> path forward. Then uh, to forward, to future. International environment is uh, nowadays very different, but uh, actually uh, the need to strengthen security remains almost the same as in 70s. Security is uh, number one for each nation, for each individual to feel itself, herself, himself secure. That's the basic element of life. So this need is uh, still existing and remains the same. We face uh, huge challenges, great power competition, nuclear arms and arms control altogether, pandemia and uh, climate change. I think we should find again a spirit, an attitude, a positive attitude that is uh, maybe the Helsinki spirit in the future too. We need dialogue, we need trust, we need security and cooperation, and we need those 10 principles agreed in Helsinki and uh, agreed in Paris too. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Ninisto. I'm struck by the uh, the emphasis you put on, on trust. Is this the most important missing ingredient today, would you say? Well, we all know if we don't have trust, we don't actually cooperate. We have doubts, but not trust. So, uh, a doubtful never actually can agree on something because doubts are there. To, to have trust, you have to forget your doubts. I think it's a main element to trust each other, to trust our institutions. Thank you. Uh, Minister Maas, I, I'm, I'm turning to, to you now in, in Berlin. Um, obviously, that time was an, uh, an extraordinary time for, for Germany 
particularly. Um, and what can we learn today from this uh, Helsinki spirit that uh, has been described by both uh, Monsieur Le Drian and President Minister uh, 30 years later? What can we learn that could be used in today's challenging environment? Thank you, Madam Kaufmann. Mr. President, uh, Jean-Yves and Mr. Zagorski, uh, let me quote uh, the former German Chancellor, Billy Prandt. Uh, once he said, know what belongs together will grow back together. With these famous words, he described the German reunification. And what is often overlooked uh, is that Willy Brandt's perspective went far beyond Germany. As someone who, uh, who helped pave the way to Helsinki final act, he knew just as East and West Germany belonged together, so did Western and Eastern Europe. And this idea lies at the heart of the Paris Carter. It marked, I think, a moment of joy in the German and the European history, the end of the division of our country and of our continent. And it marked the hope for a new era of democracy, peace, and unity in Europe, as is stated in, in the Carter itself. So for the past 30 years, Europe has indeed been more democratic, more stable, more prosperous than ever before in its history. And thanks to the institutions such as the European Union, NATO and OSCE. But I think we cannot overlook that the hope and optimism of 1990 are long gone. Conflicts have returned to our continent and by annexing Crimea, Russia has openly violated the order established in Helsinki and in Paris. Now, where does all of this leave the idea of a cooperative Europe zone of peace, security, and prosper prosperity? My take is that the Carter of Paris is more than an idealistic description of a better Europe. We have seen its achievements over the past 30 years. That is why we must make an effort today to draw lessons and to revive the, the Carter spirit. I think first, the Paris Carter was a result of persist, persistent multilateral diplomacy, bridging geopolitical divisions. And that shows us security needs strength strength and deterrence, but also dialogue and compromise. And let me say in Joe Biden, we will soon have a new US president in the White House who is committed to multilateral diplomacy. He has indicated firmness towards Russia, but he has also shown a willingness to engage Moscow, for example, on arms control, which remains as relevant today as it was during the Cold War. Europe and the OSCE should prepare for such an opening. And I think it is our chance to advance the idea that European security cannot be achieved without or even against Russia. And second, the Charter of Paris laid the cornerstone for the OSCE and to build a more stable European security architecture, we need to strengthen this organization. Since it's creation, it has made important contributions to maintaining peace on our continent. Its special monitoring mission to Ukraine has helped preserve the current ceasefire. And in the ongoing conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, the OSCE could provide a platform for negotiations on a sustainable political settlement through its Minsk group. And at the same time, the OSCE is facing challenges that we must overcome. Its conventional arms control architecture, for, for instance, is in a dire state. The structured dialogue, which we launched in 2016, could implement US-Russian talk on nuclear disarmament and could open new paths to a dialogue on peace and security in Europe. And if we Europeans want to be heard in these discussions, 
then the European, the European Union especially, must find a common position on Russia by making full use of the five principles established by Federica Mogherini. This would also be a building block for the more sovereign Europe that Jean-Yves talked about. And third, the Charter of Paris showed us that the comprehensive security goes beyond tanks, missiles, and nuclear warheads. The European success story of the past 30 years is based on an economic development and progress in human rights, media freedom, and rule of law. And this idea of a comprehensive security is the bedrock of our peace and prosperity. And this is what those who oppress civil society, imprison journalists, and quash any opposition should always remember. Conflicts like the one in Belarus will not be solved without respect for human rights, political participation, and social justice. And that is why we will continue to back the OSCE in all its dimensions. This includes the economic and the environmental dimension and the human dimension. So, ladies and gentlemen, history did not end in 1990. The Charter of Paris does send us a crucial message. Security is built on trust, as the president already mentioned. And trust is the result of a dialogue with all those concerned. This is where every discussion in, on European security needs to start. And its goal is nothing less than keeping together what belongs together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And thank you for pointing out also that uh, all was not negative in those past 30 years. There are indeed uh, bigger areas of freedom and uh, democracy and prosperity in Europe. Uh, than there were uh, in 1988, let's say. Um, Professor Zagorski, um, as I pointed out earlier, you were there. Um, and of course, the mood was extremely different, as we've uh, all uh, said. And the Russian then Soviet leader was also different. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev was in a very different um, uh, mood and approach uh, himself. There have been, in, in, in the pre previous speakers before you have uh, made mention of, of our relationship with Russia. How, how do you see Russia coming back in the game? And, and you know, can, can we still have, from, from where you sit in Moscow, does the Helsinki process or spirit still mean something? Can it be revived? Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to take part in this panel. Uh, let me begin by uh, going back 30 years ago. Uh, the Gorbachev's proposal later in December 1989 to hold a Helsinki II meeting, and that turned out to be the meeting in Paris approving the Charter of Paris, was motivated first and foremost by the very clear recognition that the Yalta order was eroding. With the collapse of the communist regimes in Eastern Europe, the German unification was looming on the horizon, uh, and uh, the several motives behind the Gorbachev proposal included, of course, the need of coming together and uh, have a clear talk about how we manage the transition from the Yalta order to a better uh, to a better group. Several issues were important for, uh, for Gorbachev. Uh, one of the ideas on the Soviet side was, of course, to seek embedding the German unification in the pan-European framework. Uh, this proved to be unrealistic, and it was realized very early in the, in the process. Uh, the second uh, very important idea was to uh, seek for establishing an inclusive European uh, architect security architecture, which would also provide the Soviet Union, then Russia, uh, with the proper uh, participation and the proper place, and which would be comfortable for the democratizing Russia. At this time, we were discussing the politicization of the military alliances, both the Warsaw Pact, which still existed at that time, as well as uh, NATO. Uh, and this is also why the 
Soviet idea at that time was to begin institutionalizing the CDC. The Ch Charter of Paris made the first step. It did not yet establish the permanent institutions. This was done later on. Uh, and the crucial forum was uh, the Helsinki decisions in 1992. But the basic idea would be discussed not only by the Soviet Union, but also implicit in several other proposals, like those raised by the Czechoslovak Foreign Minister Irzy Hayek at that time, the Polish Prime Minister Tadeusz Mazowiecki, was indeed uh, suggesting that a pan-European inclusive security framework would be built on the basis of the CSC, later on the OEC. It would be a gradual process, uh, beginning with the politicization of the military alliances, uh, and then them either becoming part of or being dissolved within the pan uh, framework. Similar ideas were also raised by some Polish politicians in Germany uh, as well at that time. So that was, uh, that was the vision uh, for, for where to go. Uh, number three is uh, the Soviet commitment to the common values in 1990. Uh, was absolutely consistent with the changes which occurred in the Soviet Union. Uh, since 1987, 1988. Uh, by the time the summit in Paris took place, uh, the Soviet Union abandoned the constitutional political monopoly of the Communist Party. Uh, new laws were adopted allowing for political pluralism in 1990 and the elections uh, in the republics of the former Soviet Union in 1990 were already taking place with the legalized, institutionalized opposition, in fact, resulting in the, in the defeat uh, of uh, the Communist parties in many uh, places in the Soviet Union. The law on the freedom of media was there, but the media was already very active at the time. The law on the freedom of movement was in the pipeline, uh, and many other, other changes were taking place. So in fact, in fact, whatever we had in the Copenhagen document 1990, uh, and uh, in the Charter of Paris was absolutely consistent with, uh, with the changes underway in the Soviet Union. However, we shall not forget that this was not the only trend in the Soviet Union. Exactly in the year 1990, there was a growing opposition to Gorbachev, and uh, the opposition was, the conservative opposition was consolidated. Uh, and uh, we had in the summer of 1990, the constituent Congress of the Russian Communist Party, which was, uh, a point of consolidation of the political opposition to Gorbachev uh, within the Soviet Union. We had increasingly increasing critique of Gorbachev politics, both domestic and uh, uh, external. Uh, the Soviet defense establishment would not believe that the CFE treaty would be signed. At the end, and the culmination of this critique was coming at the end of 1990 with the resignation of Shevardnadze uh, as foreign minister. Uh, and the strong push toward, uh, toward more, more conservative policy. We had in August 1991 an abortive uh, coup d'etat in the Soviet Union and the loss, uh, the, the failure of the conservatives to take power uh, was of course releasing a lot of, a lot of uh, democracy movements, although it also resulted in the collapse of the Soviet Union. So by the end of the day, uh, by the end of the day, uh, many of the, uh, Expectations which we had in 1990 when, when drafting the Charter of Paris did not materialize. We do not have an inclusive security architecture in Europe. We, we have new dividing lines and deepening dividing lines for, for whatever reason. We are back to mutual uh, containment, military containment. Uh, and of course, the situation today is uh, to some extent reminiscent of what we had in the Cold War, of course, although not, not the same, not of the same intensity. And this is why, uh, going back to what uh, the President Minister has mentioned, uh, and also the, the ministers, uh, uh, we need to go back to the Charter, to the Charter spirit, and I hope we manage to come back to the Charter. But we will not be able to manage it without uh, restoring dialogue and restoring the channels of communication. This is why uh, I would uh, fully agree that uh, uh, a summit meeting uh, of the OEC would be hardly possible today. Uh, but it is needed uh, because without, without dialogue, uh, we will not come back to the Charter. So we need to come together and sort out where we are now and where we want to go. So let me, let me finalize by uh, 
uh, setting uh, an idea, a vision, which uh, of course may be seen as idealistic by many, as it is. Now in 2025, five years from now, we will have 50 years of the Helsinki final. Why don't we embark on the process of Helsinki plus 50 and arrange a dialogue in this direction, uh, which may result uh, sooner or later in a Helsinki type and Paris type meeting, which would help us to sort out the way we are going to, uh, to proceed in this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Zagorski, and thank you for expressing, finishing with this idealistic uh, proposal, because I think there was a lot of idealism also uh, in the Helsinki spirit. So, um, you know, there's always room for idealism, even today. Um, I have already several questions, uh, but maybe I will, from, from the audience, maybe I will um, ask, go back immediately to you, Professor uh, Zagorski. Um, with this situation in the, in the Caucasus that I mentioned, and which was mentioned actually by um, uh, Minister Le Drian and Minister Maas also, this, this militarization of foreign policy that we are uh, witnessing uh, at the moment, do you, I mean, do you think it's, uh, it's obviously totally uh, antagonistic with the, with the uh, spirit of the Paris Charter and the Helsinki spirit? Do you see a possibility of going back from that kind of, of uh, trend? Uh, we need to think of it, but let me also remind you that uh, in 1990, when the Charter of Paris was drafted, already the wars and the conflicts in former Yugoslavia were winning. Mm -hmm. The process of disintegration began already at that time. And beginning from 1991, this was one of the major headaches uh, and one of the major themes was for extraordinary meetings of the senior officials of the, of the CSC uh, to discuss the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia and later followed by conflicts uh, in the former Soviet Union. Uh, of course, uh, of course, uh, we uh, need to spend uh, time and effort on uh, getting back to demilitarizing such conflicts. And uh, I would believe that the, uh, the changes which we have seen in the European security architecture more recently and the discord and some kind of bilateralism, the resumed bilateralism, uh, were exactly supportive for the recurrence of uh, military hostilities in various places, not only in Karabakh, most recently, yes, and most dramatically, yes, in Karabakh, with many of uh, the right forces. Uh, the CSC and the OEC, particularly in the 1990s, was a place in which uh, the countries were also exerting pressure on the, uh, on the parties in the various conflicts. And this was helpful in terms of uh, coming down to the solutions the time when we uh, have a controversy and a confrontation between Russia and the West, of course, uh, this uh, expands the room for, uh, for a renationalization of uh, uh, security policies by others. Of course, the Karabakh story, story is much more complex. Of course, we must see decades uh, uh, of the uh, arms race in the region of arming uh, themselves. We also need to see the, the uh, political developments in both countries more recently, which were conducive for, for resuming uh, military activities instead of uh, continuing uh, with negotiations. Uh, but again, an active engagement uh, of uh, major European institutions, as well as of major powers in Europe, in bringing about a political solution uh, would be needed. And for this, we need a stronger consensus among ourselves uh, to help peace in this region. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have several questions on, on the future Biden administration and whether it is a chance uh, uh, to, you know, for a new, a new start. Um, President Minister, do you see such a chance? Uh, is it enough? Well, it has been expressed that uh, USA is coming back to the tables. And I, I do believe that uh, their impact on multilateral cooperation will be a different one from what we have seen during the last years. Uh, that is uh, undoubtedly a very positive 
signal. Uh, one element uh, I would like to take up here is that we talk a lot about uh, Europe, a lot about uh, what was the state of the world in 70, in 75, in uh, 1990. But uh, today we have to face that uh, uh, such a thinking doesn't reflect actually the whole world in a similar way or such combinations we are talking here. Uh, this is an element, uh, I think, that, uh, that uh, the USA has to take notice too. Thank you very much. Would you, do you agree, Minister Maas? Yes, I absolutely agree. I think many things will improve with Joe Biden, but not everything will be different. Joe Biden, as President Inistro said, is a convinced multilateralist. And this will lead to the fact that the United States will, in international organizations and also with big international dossiers, will assume a bigger role. Joe Biden said in one of the speeches after the election results were known, he said, this is not only about the US. And I think that's absolutely true. All big challenges we are facing, globalization, digitalization, climate change, and of course, most importantly, the corona pandemic right now, these are international challenges that require international solutions. And over the last few years, the U.S. have been missed a lot because the strategy in Washington has been a different one. And the same is true for the OSCE, for example, and most importantly, issues of arms control. We've seen the end of the INF Treaty. We've seen that the U.S. have left the Open Skies Treaty. And we would very much hope that the issue of uh, disarmament and arms control becomes an issue uh, in which the United States will be a, an active player again, because only that way we will be successful in um, making sure that Russia and China will be open to such a dialogue, will be willing to face such a dialogue. And I think, yes, as uh, many others have said, in international policy, trust is a cornerstone uh, and a lot of um, trust has been gambled away. And if the U.S. president had an agenda that builds on respect, trust and decency, I think that will change many things on the international level and will make things much easier than they have been over the last three, four years. Um, Mr. Le Drian, um, uh, Europe... Uh, is bigger in a way today, uh, but it's, it is less united. Um, and I have this question from uh, somebody in the audience. How can the European Union reach a united position vis-a-vis -vis Russia and the United States? J'ai bien noté tout à l'heure l'importance que mettait le président finlandais sur le retour de l'esprit d'Helsinki. Euh, et je pense que c'est le centre du, du débat. Et si cette discussion peut servir, peut contribuer à retrouver cet esprit qui, effectivement, est basé sur la confiance, ce serait une avancée supplémentaire. L'hypothèse de, des 50 ans d'Helsinki que proposait M. Zagorski tout à l'heure est une bonne hypothèse dans, dans le futur. Et dans l'immédiat, puisqu'il y a la... la concomitance d'une de, montée des militarisations des conflits, euh, y compris dans la proximité européenne, mais aussi euh, l'arrivée d'une nouvelle administration américaine, je pense qu'il faut que nous réfléchissions ensemble sur euh, deux choses. D'abord sur les conditions du renouveau de la relation transatlantique. Il y a des sujets sur lesquels je crois qu'il sera assez facile d'avancer dans une nouvelle donne. Je pense euh, à l'enjeu climatique, je pense aussi à, à l'enjeu pandémique. Mais il y a des sujets qui sont plus compliqués et sur lesquels il faudrait s'atteler euh, dès maintenant, 
qui concerne la question de la sécurité collective, et c'était le but, de, 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 entre autres, de la charte. Et à cet égard, euh, je pense que la, la, la question de la sécurité dans la maîtrise des armements est tout à fait essentielle. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, euh, nous, nous sommes démunis, euh, et donc nous sommes devenus en Europe une zone à risque, euh, nous sommes revenus euh, à la situation de la crise des euromissiles des années 80, euh, de, de, du fait de la, la réduction, de la, le, le non, la non reconduction de, de beaucoup d'accords. Et donc nous avons, je crois, à prendre des initiatives à cet égard, euh, à la fois avec euh, les États-Unis d'Amérique, mais aussi euh, à en parler avec, avec les Russes, pour qu'on euh, puisse rouler les fils parce que c'est l'intérêt de tout le monde. Et l'intérêt de tout le monde, c'est aussi que, dans cette affaire, l'Union européenne affirme sa propre identité. Je, je ne partage pas totalement euh, votre avis, Madame Kaufmann, sur une Europe divisée. Je trouve que, au contraire, depuis euh, quelques années, même singulièrement au, au cours des quatre années que nous venons, venons de vivre sous la présidence Trump aux États-Unis, dans les moments majeurs, il y a eu l'accord sur la, les, les difficultés de, de, de discussion commerciale avec les États-Unis, euh, les Européens étaient unis. Euh, sur l'enjeu du Brexit euh, qui aurait pu amener des divisions, les Européens étaient unis. Euh, sur euh, l'enjeu du numérique, ce n'est pas encore le cas, mais ça progresse. Donc moi, je sens plutôt une affirmation de l'identité européenne au cours de ces dernières années, une espèce de dynamique dans cette direction qu'il nous faut maintenant conforter dans la nouvelle de l'international, à la fois pour montrer aux États-Unis que c'est l'intérêt aussi des États-Unis d'avoir une Europe plus forte et plus affirmée, y compris en matière de sécurité collective, et pour montrer aussi à la Russie qu'il faut discuter avec l'ensemble européen et que ça ne sert à rien d'essayer de, de disloquer le bloc européen. Je, je ne suis pas, je suis plutôt optimiste sur cette situation et il faut que, aussi que les États-Unis d'Amérique acceptent de constater que cette souveraineté plus affirmée est aussi un élément de la qualité de la relation que nous pouvons avoir avec eux. Very good. I hope, uh, I hope there are some American listeners. <laughs> uh, President Minister, uh, talking to Russia is something you know a little bit about uh, in Finland. Uh, on what conditions do you see this? Uh, do you see a, a real dialogue with Russia, a productive dialogue with Russia, uh, working or opening? Uh, first, uh, just a minor example from arms control. We been hosting here during this uh, autumn uh, discussions between uh, US uh, Russian governments uh, concerning arms control. That is that uh, how I see the Finnish role is that we have to have uh, such uh, governments which are offering good services. That is uh, maybe quite natural for uh, smaller countries like Finland, but uh, Uh, what we found here is that, however, the situation is complex, however, there is the possibility of uh, continuing discussions, and that is uh, uh, very important. Uh, an overall approach that, well, now Europe, uh, Russia, European Union, Russia, United States are having uh, all the agenda tabled. I think that will fail. But we have to try to find certain issues which are of common interest. Now, I, I have been talking quite a lot about uh, environment and a specific uh, phenomenon there, that is the black carbon which is uh, getting down in Arctic and uh, uh, surely melting the uh, snow and ice. Uh, this was an element which uh, I was very actually delighted to see that uh, 
uh, it was understood completely both in Russia and uh, in in the states, even by President Trump. And uh, it's surely a minor factor, but if we can work through minor issues, collecting those minor issues, that will be a big issue at the end. So I think the approach should now be finding something which is in common interest. But now I want to point out again that uh, that uh, we can't forget that uh, the world is now different uh, than uh, still in Paris uh, in 90s, we then, one could very well think that, well, almost all of the world is here uh, represented, or at least the most important issues will be tabled by these most important participants. This is now different. So <clears throat> uh, if talking about Helsinki spirit and renewing that, we should uh, have uh, quite a wider aspect to the state of the world today. Thank you. We are really uh, getting uh, towards the end of our session and I'll have a very short question for you, Minister Maas. Uh, it's a question put forward by uh, uh, one of our um, uh, listeners. It's about the Green Deal and it's a very simple question. In fact, is, is the Green Deal part of the Helsinki spirit? Yes, absolutely, because I would like to continue on what President Inistro said, not only with a view to Russia, when it comes to trust building measures, we also need to think uh, about issues that might not be have a security dimension in a difficult sense immediately. So I think the Green Deal, the topic of climate change is such an issue. It really expresses the Helsinki spirit to be dealing with things that are challenges to all of us. And I believe that climate change is such a global challenge. And with the formats and possibilities we have within the OSCE, we have something to work with. So yes, the Green Deal is part of this, and it might be one opportunity to win back trust that we that have has been lost step by step by working together with many others on such an issue and i think it would be a good opportunity to carry on the spirit of helsinki in this area and to revive that spirit thank you very much uh, monsieur le drian i think i will give you the floor or a final word before we conclude this session. Ce sont des conclusions tout à fait provisoires parce que l'ampleur des sujets que nous avons abordés nous laisse des champs d'action et de d'initiatives et de réflexions communes considérables. Mais je voulais surtout insister sur sur un point en, en, en conclusion provisoire, c'est que nous avons une responsabilité particulière à l'égard de notre maison commune qui s'appelle l'OSCE, parce que aujourd'hui, pour euh, qu'il y ait le, un lieu de la réflexion, le lieu de l'esprit d'Helsinki, il faut que cette euh, maison fonctionne bien, sinon euh, c'est l'ensemble de la structure qui, qui vacillera. Et donc, euh, je souhaite vraiment que le, le prochain conseil ministériel de l'OSCE puisse euh, être l'opportunité de mettre en valeur la force que peut représenter cette, ce forum, cette instance, et que ce soit aussi la possibilité de prendre des initiatives supplémentaires, y compris dans les compétences qu'a l'OSCE, que vient de souligner ICOMA sur le pacte vert, par exemple, pour donner de, du tonus et, et de la force à cette organisation qui, aujourd'hui, est en crise. Et donc, nous avons un rendez-vous urgent qui est celui-là, il se tient dans peu de temps et je souhaite que l'état d'esprit d'Helsinki puisse être présent à ce moment-là pour rétablir la confiance et les missions initiales données à cette organisation. Thank you very much. Um, so we have uh, several, I think, several avenues uh, 
opened here, if I may say, to try to revive this uh, Helsinki spirit. We have the Green Deal. <laughs> um, we have uh, a new a new um, administration in Washington and uh, the hope of a new, uh, more dynamic and more cooperative uh, uh, relation, transatlantic relationship. We have, if I believe, uh, Minister Le Drian and Minister Mas, a stronger Europe, <laughs> more united. <laughs> and, um, and I think we also have to do some work on OSCE. Uh, since we have uh, seen how much of a, a, a crisis it is going to, uh, uh, institutional crisis particularly. So thank you very, very much uh, to our four uh, speakers, President Minister, thank you so much, Minister Maas, Minister Le Drian, and Professor Zagorski, thank you very much for taking part in this session. And uh, have a great day at the Paris Peace Forum. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.